Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by John Palmer, who is the sales strategist from Hoshino USA. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Bart. Good to be here. Yeah, man, we've been working on this one for a while, um, and it's it's just one of those things where sometimes they uh, the stars don't align with with scheduling, but um, but we're here now, and I have had many people reach out and say, "Hey, you should do a Tama episode," and I go, "We're working on it. We're we're uh, <laughs> it's coming together." Yeah. Um, so yeah, I appreciate uh, you guys sent me some some books here, which are awesome. Which is the history of Tama, the story behind the strongest name in drums, um, which I just blew right through because it was so cool and it's kind of a little, you know, handy pocket size um book. So, um, yeah, how long have you worked at Tama? So or Hoshino, I should say. Yeah. So um, exactly. Well, yeah, we'll we'll get into Tama and Hoshino and the relationship certainly, um, Bart and. And, you know, I, I've been here, I'm in my sixth year. So I started late cool. uh, 2015 um, and have been in the industry for, for many years. So I uh, have a, you know, a lifetime drummer, um, you know, big, big fan of drums and drumming, just like you in your community. And, um, yeah. you know, really fortunate to, you know, to work uh, for this brand and, and have had a, a pretty, you know, long career in the industry. So it's just, it's great. The people are great. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of living the dream. So things are good. Yeah. Yeah. Tama, um, I know I've said this on the show before and it's probably confusing because I'll say this was my first, this drum set. And this was like, I started off with a big old Ludwig set, but then when I actually, you know, I worked at a butcher when I was really young, like a grocery store butcher Mm. for, for a few years and I saved up and I bought a brand new, um, Thomas star classic kit, which I would deem that my first real, drum set when I was like 12 or something. And, um, that was just the most beautiful. I had it forever. I actually ended up selling it when I was like, I mean, I was probably 25 or something. Um, but beautiful drums, there's something, the star classic line in general, obviously all of the lines are just great, but, um, they are so well respected, so innovative. I think that's something we'll obviously talk about is just the innovation, which before I read the book, um, I didn't really realize how many things Tama invented. Mm. Um, it's just amazing. Such a cool company. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I think that is it, the essence of what the Tama brand has become and, and, you know, was when it was, you know, finding its way, um, you know, is the innovation. And I always look at the, the product, you know, say the product is the star, you know, for Tama yeah. and they just, the, the, when I say they, the R and D team, you know, the, the design team the market research team, um, you know, which is centered in, in Japan, they do their, their students and do an incredible exacting job of, of, you know, finding out what's happening at a very detailed level in the market and then working to improve any way possible. And it, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive to, to watch the work uh, on the R and D side happen. Cause I think it fuels the, the brand. It's exactly what it is. It's too, I think this should be said, it's one of those brands where kind of like Peisty or some of these others where there is, you hear people say the name differently, oh, Tama, right. Tama, which is just sort of a thing. But obviously you're saying Tama. That's kind of what I, um, I think I started saying Tama as a kid. Mm-hmm. And then I just kind of realized like, I think it's Tama and just sort of, um, so, but we get to hear straight from you. It's, it's Tama, correct? So, so that was my very first question on my very first day uh you know formally and even you know i i started and i'm in ben salem pennsylvania it's where i work it's where where the the hoshino um you know distribution center is and offices for the usa so i i started my first day and i said okay let's just get this question out of the way how do you pronounce the name and i was told by uh by, by charlie hayashi tama and, you, you know, go. if you if you know a little bit about Japanese, it, it's, you know, you know that, you know, you can say sayonara, you can say tama. I mean, those things roll off the tongue, um, you know, ichiro. And so they, they're not going to say tama in Japan. And yeah. so when they say tama, I say tama. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I say tama, <laughs> yeah. but I'm cool. However, it's pronounced. I meet a lot of people that say tama, tamer, tamer, you know, all kinds <laughs> yeah. of great pronunciations that are americanized and and fine with me you know um and i think yeah. it is like peisty and minor you know and and 
you know, Zilchin and, and there's so many oh, yeah. colorful brand names in the industry. So we're just one of them. Yeah, that's so true. Tama, it's that, that very American. It is. I mean, I'm, I'm in the Midwest where, you know, everything's kind of that Tama. It's that got that, that feel to it. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's a little draw happening, you know, and, and, exactly. and that's cool. So no worries. If you say Tama, Tama, Termer, whatever you say, it's yeah. all good. So, you know, <laughs> um, so I, I think, Bart, can I jump in? Cause we're, we're kind of, you know, hitting the umbrella topics of, of the, the brand. And so can I, can I hit into the history a little bit and kind of yes, give an please, overview? Please do. Cause there's, there's a great story about why we call our drums Tama. And, um, so here's the story. So, you know, and, and what is Hoshino, you know, and, and people are like, well, what is that? So here's the deal. Um, so Hoshino was established by in 1908 in Japan, family owned business by a, na- a man named Mr. Yoshitara Hoshino. Okay. And he had a bookstore in Nagoya, Japan, and he sold music books to schools back in 1908. So he, he's in kind of the music, you know, education business. And, and then he added musical instruments um, to, to his business. So that's how he got into the musical instrument business way back in 1908. Um, his wife was named Tama Hoshino. Hmm. So there's the brand name. And yeah. it's, it's a pretty cool story. So Tama Hoshino, and she was involved in the business as well. So, you know, that's a pretty cool story. And, and a couple other cool things is, so for Hoshino, Hoshi, that part of the name means star, and no means field. So you put it together, Hoshi, star, and no and field. You have star field. And then we are Hoshino Gaki, and Gaki means musical instruments. So basically, um, Hoshino Gaki means star field of musical instruments. And then the wow. name Tama has a name, it, it has a meaning as well, and it means plenty fullness. So there it is, Starfield. And so what a cool thing is, is we have this really natural kind of organic naming for the brand and for, obviously, you've mentioned it already, Star Classic and, you know, Tama, you know, you don't have to even be a Tama fan to know that Tama does everything Star, right? Star yeah. cast, Star you know, swing uh, star, yeah, everything star. So that's why we do it. It's really super, you know, natural naming convention that just follows our legacy. So that's, that's hmm. a, an important part of the history um, that it lets people know that, you know, we're, we're just kind of true to our roots really. Yeah, man, that's so um, beautifully Japanese uh, just to have that, that I didn't know that that really it's cool to think that the the Hoshino s- star field I mean it really kind of uh, makes it all it it all makes sense then yeah it's just yeah a, it really cool pulls it to together think. doesn't it Bart yeah yeah okay so 1908 unbelievable I mean this is a hundred and thirteen year old company right I mean, that's um, unbelievable right right so yeah we have quite a legacy. Um, and, 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 and we do also, we do Ibanez guitars. So I think probably some of your, you know, um, listeners know that, but we, we own the Ibanez guitar brand and the Tama drum brand. Um, but there seems to be a real close connection with Hoshino and the Tama brand because it, it is, you know, it's, it's the founder's wife's name, right? So there's a huge family legacy and we're still family owned by people named Hoshino. You know, those are the brand holders. So the legacy of the company is four generations long and continues to evolve under the Hoshino direction. Hmm. Wow. So cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So then we start off selling, you know, musical books and everything. Yeah. How long did that go before he got into, you know, Other producing instruments. musical instruments in yeah. the thirties. I think, um, this, this, the kind of the story goes that I, that I know, uh, Segovia comes over and, and plays some classical music in the thirties and it, the, the classical guitar craze in Japan, uh, went, went pretty fervent. So there's interest in people like, can I get a guitar? So there was a guitar brand, Spanish guitar brand, um, called Ibanez. No, not Ibanez in Spain. It's called Ibanez. So, you know, that's the guitar brand in Spain, Ibanez. And uh, I'm not sure the details, but we ended up acquiring 
the Ibanez brand and, and everybody calls it Ibanez. So that was in, I think, the 30s, 40s. So we, yes. we get into musical instruments then. Uh, and then post-World War II, you know, this is really, it's, it's quite, quite a history, a company history and, and how it mirrors world history. Obviously, World War II uh, is, is a major, you know, nothing's happening. It's, it's, you know, as far as production of musical instruments. Um, and so it's the evolution of the company after World War II. And, and just as it is the evolution of Japan. And it really mirrors, I think, the manufacturing and, and you know, the evolution of the country post-World War II. And, and Hoshino is very tied, very much a, a, a uh, you know, a, I don't know, corporate sort of, not even corporate, that's a strong word, but just a developing manufacturer um, that took steps like many other manufacturers did after World War II. It's so interesting with World War II how it affected so many different industries. Obviously, the drum industry is maybe in the big picture kind of a, you know, a small little thing, but it definitely rocked the world of drums and everything kind of changed after that. Um, right. Exactly. So the MIJ phenomenon that we're experiencing now, you know, that all happened back in the 60s. And it, I think, I think uh, the Beatles, you know, certainly had an influence and 1964 hit and People want to play drums. So we, we realized, okay, we started a, a, a factory in 1962 um, in Japan to, to build OEM, which is original equipment manufacturing. And that's mm -hmm. basically to supply other brands a product. They, and so we build it, they buy it, they put their name on it. And that happened for a while in the 60s. Um, the factory in 1962 was named the Tama Factory. But we were not making Tama drums at that point. So we were making original equipment manufactured drums. Some of those drums were sold to big box retailers at the time, such as Montgomery Ward, which was a, uh, an old school retailer uh, that was like mm -hmm. a Sears competitor. And you would see different brands um, coming out of, of the, the OEM factory that were certainly not Tama. And then... In about 1967, Tama realized, well, let's put our own name on the drums. And, of course, because of the, the Hoshino name, called the drum Star. Yeah. So that was the first Hoshino-branded drum set was Star Drums back in, like, 67, 68. Wow. And you can always typically tell something that's related to Hoshino because it says World Supreme Quality, correct? Mm-hmm. Which is kind of a neat, neat little thing to to know. It's a cool thing, and and absolutely, you know the I think the the gestalt of, of the Japanese culture in the '60s was was to to imitate and take the best, you know, of of anything they imitated, and then try to improve on that. And what a what a formula for success. And you can certainly look at you know the photo um, photography industry or the bike industry or or you know so many different industries, the television industry. The, and then the automobile industry, you know, which everybody knows. And I think that is a blueprint to the formula. And certainly I'm not qualified to speak about that, but I'm sure there's manufacturing experts and, his, you know, history experts that can go deep. And, and it, it's quite a fascinating study. But we were just one, you know, company that was trying to do that very modestly in, in the drum industry. Yeah, it's so neat to see the, um, <clears throat> and I've talked about it with other people where, there's, there's just something, obviously they, they call them stencil drums too, as I'm sure you know, where, where it would be like, you know, Hey, all the kids are buying Ludwig and Slingerland. Let's make the drums look like Ludwig and Slingerland. And a lot of them are, um, very, uh, very close, um, you know, representations of like the throw, like a Rogers throw off or like, uh, this, like I have a Hoshino kit and the badge from, from 10 feet away. It's like, is that a Slingerland set? Yeah. Oh no, it's not, you know, so, um, just that sort of, uh, just, it's, it's just very interesting. And I think a lot of it, I've talked with people before about it, where a lot of it is because it's the Japanese market. It was like the American brands weren't really going to, who are they going to go after to say, Hey, quit using our style. So, um, not that it's, I mean, I guess there are some legality, but I've, I've run into that too with European brands where like the turret lug, you know, the George way turret lug where, um, Heyman drums was using it. And it's like, once you go across the, the, the ocean, there's, 
there's not as much it's sort of it's different with copyright and all that it, it is i mean it depends where you where you file the patent and you know yeah. so sometimes it's just usa only sometimes you know now obviously with globalization um you know those those intellectual properties are very sensitive and more far reaching and and certainly you know china is um become a major you know source of of recognition and and you know, we pay a lot of attention to that so is yeah. and, and even the tama brand name you know is that a brand name that's registered in in europe and and in you know uh, asia and you know africa and really every continent because you have to register it um for it to be protected so it's it's a lot of money to protect the brand integrity globally um so that's you know yeah you see certain pockets of things that maybe aren't protected and you know, then you got to go after it, and then you got to recognize it. So that's that's another discussion about the business, you know, legal part. And and I'm I'm again not an expert on that, but I have an yeah. awareness. But that's a fascinating topic, Bart. I, I think you should get a, a patent attorney or <laughs> copyright attorney on at some point and and have that discussion because that's a pretty fascinating topic. I I think it is, and it's just I, I've learned with my my wife is an attorney, and there's so many like i would bring that up to her i would bring something up about you know whatever intellectual property or something and it's like it's like speaking a different language because it's so many different you know i guess you'd call it verticals of law that it'd be like it's not what they do you need to find i just think that's interesting with law it's like oh no 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 i'm a elder care law lawyer or i'm a estate lawyer so even to a lawyer that stuff is confusing if it's not the right you know, field that they're in. So I, I imagine for, for a drum company or whoever, it gets a little, uh, a little hairy, um, to, to, it's brand protection. You know, I, I mean, every brand goes through that and they have, you know, legal teams to, to to work on that stuff dedicated. And, um, you know, we're, we're just, I mean, the industry, the drum industry is the perception is, Oh, those big drum companies, it's not that big, you know? And yeah, you know, we're not that big of a business. We're just, we're just kind of a humble, you know, just some dudes who, who, yeah, of course we're, we're, you know, into business and functionality of business, but you know, it's not a, it's not like heavy corporate, you know, yeah. you know meetings and, uh, you know, starch in the shirts. There's none of that going on here. You know, we're just, we're sure. just, we're just trying to build a product that, that is inspires people. And it's, you know, that in, in the, the entire drum industry is like that, you know, what you see, you meet people at NAM, you know, the, the guys from the other brands, they're all cool dudes and it's a cool little community, you know, just like the, the, the people who are not in the industry, but play the product. And, you know, we go to retail stores and, you know, it's certainly non COVID times it, it's, there's a flow that happens and, and, a, yeah. and there's sort of a gentle vibe that permeates, you know, the, the industry. And, and, and that's one of the, the, the beautiful parts of the industry. You know, it's just like yourself, you know, you're, you're a laid back dude, you know, we're, and we're, we're going to get there and, and everything's going to be cool. And, you know, yeah. I, I dig that. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, and, and I learned that on other episodes with like, like Vic Firth, for example, I was like, you guys are huge. And he was like, well, there's like seven of us here. And yeah. I'm like, you're Vic Firth. And obviously there's more distribution and all that, but it's just, uh, it's cool to know that. And, and it kind of has its, obviously it has its roots back to being a smaller kind of scrappy company. Um, but you know, it, it, Tama is one of those brands that I, I think, you know, this, but so with the MIJ, the made in Japan, the stencil stuff, I mean, it rocked the world of, um, the American brands. And I think we're going to be approaching that air, er, that area of like when, when, when star became actually Tama, but, yeah. um, it's just, you can't underestimate how, like, I would imagine people here in America were like, um, we're like, you know, oh, whatever, let them do their thing. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Let them have the like beginner drum market, these cheapo kits. I don't think people maybe realized at that point how like disruptive to use like a modern, you know, right. Uh, yeah. Buzzword. It, it, it was when these, these MIJ brands, which there were a few of them in addition to Hoshino and, mm -hmm. you know, star, obviously star, but, um, I hear about it in every episode where people go, Oh man, we got killed in the seventies and eighties because the Japanese brands came out. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's so, and again, it's, so it's just a microcosm of a larger economic shift. And, and, 
you know, you, again, look at any, any industry and, you know, a brand like Sony or Panasonic or Toshiba or, you know, there's so many um, really good Japanese brands that, that, you know, very much mirrored our company history. And, and you're right. Yeah. You know, if you're, a, if you're a dominant American drum brand at that time, you know, and there weren't many, right. Cause there just weren't that many. And, you know, here come these other guys that are making, Oh yeah, it's, it's okay products, but the price was really good. So there's a, a, um, there's an economic benefit to the product. Now were the drums as hardy and sturdy and, robust as you know the american counterpart at that time maybe not at that time but mm -hmm. the, the really fascinating study is how quickly it evolved and you know changes were made very fast to manufacturing oh. and and feedback was was gathered very quickly um, and it goes back to the market research and intensive market research and study one of the cool things so so you're right so we're, we're moving into now the tama you know, we're moving out of the sixties and getting into seventies. And, and so what, what year was that? So we know, so 67, yeah. it became star. star. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Six, so we're doing star and 67, 68 up until 1974. And then in 1974, that is when Tama, the Tama brand was first put onto a drum set. So 1974 Tama's born. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, so there you go. And then at that point, I think there was realization that the brand had to evolve and, and couldn't just be a house brand, a Tama brand, without some improvements. So improvements were already happening um, at that time as far as hardware and, and the shell and, you know, just, just things just got better. And they quickly, after that launched, there was a lot. One of the cool things about, about the Hoshino company and certainly the, the the drum side the tama side it's is the people working on the projects and and, and i'm talking r d people i'm talking sales people market research people nobody i think or maybe very few were really drummers and hmm. so there was a beautiful humility and study to the market um that was done because there was no arrogance of hey i know what drummers want because i'm a drummer and yeah. that's a big deal for us. And I believe was really um, a, a very objective way to move forward based on informed comments by artists and informed comments by retailers. And we listened really closely without the preconception of we know best. And that that's a hmm. huge benefit to us. Yeah. You got to, I mean... Uh, there's there's that whole like well we do it this way because we do it this way kind of attitude with with uh with any industry but like god that's so that makes so much sense but it, it makes it you got to put yourself into that that person that that point of view then of like it's so interesting that like guys were working on this and inventing this and japanese you know culture i guess is very like forward thinking and efficient but to be working and building drums for something if you're not a drummer it's um it's really interesting. I remember on the Noble and Cooley episode, um, like the, 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 the Joneses, the two dad, the, the father and son who work there aren't drummers. And it's sort of, I was blown away by that. So yeah. I, I need to like become more like, Oh yeah, everyone's, everyone's not a drummer in the world of, uh, music, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think it's rare. Uh, you know, it's yeah, that's how true. I think drum companies are, are permeated with drummers, but, but you know, that's interesting. Noble and Cooley. Yeah. I mean, some of it's just, we manufacture and so we can make a, a round, you know, wood object or, you know, a, a cylinder and, and, and we can put some hardware on it. So why not make a drum, you know? Yeah. Some of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the, the humble, you know, predis predisposition of not knowing there was a big study and, you know, and that, and, it, and that, that spirit continues in the company today. Um, you know, and, and I, I, you know, sometimes I think I know, you know, the direction so easily because I've been in the industry, but, but oftentimes, um, I just sit back and, and watch and wait. And then, you know, there's, there's maybe a new perspective that's introduced that I hadn't considered. And, and that's due to just being super objective and asking a lot of questions. Yeah. I mean, you can't, it, it seems like Tama had a, a period where they were the ones pushing forward with everything, but as, as you know, we live in a modern time, you can't be like, you know, we're the only ones who are going to progress but when other brands 
do come in and it's sort of a like a like we're going to like, you know, brand A is going to build on what Tama did and then brand B is going to build on what brand A did. And it's just going to keep getting better and better and better and better. And I think that's sort of how the world works of yes. like otherwise we'd be sitting around, you know, driving Model A's and horse horse drawn buggies if we didn't you know keep pushing forward with technology obviously that's a car example but um, yeah, but no, i think there's a great there's a great parallel there for sure i think you, you yeah you nailed it bart it's um you know we that societies or or you know societies are built on continued improvement right and innovation and yeah i you know that's yeah. what we you know we we didn't invent it we just looked at it and said how do we improve it yeah so so some of the things just so maybe some of the cool things that um that we that we did bring into the market they were not there is is a boom stand and you know we didn't know that drummers needed to have their cymbals closer to them and drum set sizes were evolving and they couldn't get a stand close but but we asked people and somebody so there was a visit and and we do a lot of market research and it, they're, they're fun trips and we go around and and visit informed the, the informed drum community um and we ask a lot of questions and one so that happened back in the 70s and there was a con- contingency of uh Japanese headquarter guys that came over and, and did a market research trip and went to a Sam Ash store in New York. And someone said, Hey, can you make a stand? Because apparently the, the story is people were duct taping Mike boom arms onto, onto <laughs> stands and then suspending symbols because they needed their symbols wow. closer. So that's a problem to solve, right? So our engineers were like, yeah, we can do that. And we made a boom stand. Um, the, the nylon sleeve inserts, that are you know they, they go in between um, the, the pipe clamps on a, on a yeah. cymbal stand. It was metal to metal, metal to metal, and that had problems. So an engineer came up with, let me make you know, let me look at this, analyze it, and try to figure out a better way. So we made the first nylon sleeve that goes inside um, <laughs> the, the you know height adjustment collar. So there's there's some cool things and you know yeah that's and, and of course awesome. we're we're not the only company to innovate and so you're right we look we see we, we how can we do it better and other companies do the same with us and who benefits the drummers yeah there are you know scenarios where a straight stand is obviously really cool and and it can work especially like you know for your ride if you can get it low enough and kind of tucked in there but man i mean growing up i had i remember i had this one crappy little tiny toy almost straight stand it is the worst thing when you can't get the symbol in close enough yeah <laughs> and you're like tucking legs under yeah. things yeah and it's falling over so exactly that's a that's a big one yeah. yeah yeah that's a cool one yeah are we at the point too where obviously i mean you can't talk about tama without talking about billy cobham which i think was sort of in this you yeah, definitely region this, this realm yeah Right. Yeah. So there's a few, right? So Billy Cobham was a huge impact. And, and, you know, again, as, as it's so funny, I think back, cause I, I grew up in the seventies and, um, so this was all like real direct stuff for me, but I have to remember, you know, my age and there's a lot of listeners who, who are like Billy Cobham, who's that? Um, <laughs> so my recommendation is check him out. Um, he, he, he was blowing people's minds. You know, he was like the, the original gospel chops sort of drummer yeah. in, in the seventies. And he was doing things, you know, on the drum set that just were not done before. Of course he was standing on people's shoulders and you know, he took Tony Williams and, and Ginger Baker and, you know, kind of did his own thing and, and it's a beautiful thing. So check him out. Uh, and he was a big icon in the drumming industry and Thomas signed him. And I think around 1977 and yes, that was a big marketing exposure impact for Tama drums. So we realized artists were key. Now it, the, apparently the, how it happened was he was just wandering around a NAM show. I think it was in Houston uh, at that time. And he just saw some things that Tama was doing from a product standpoint. And he was open to checking out, uh, certainly ideas and, and ways to improve his playing. So there was, an, again, an organic sort of interest to the products, and that's what led Billy to us, and he was huge for us. We also, around that time, had Lenny White, who was another yeah. killer fusion guy. And then Stuart Copeland goes way back to, like, 1975 or 74 when he oh, reviewed yeah. a Tama drum set for a British, uh, a, bit, a British music publication 
and he was doing reviews and he was sent a set and he's like, these drums are cool. And so he became, mm-hmm. I don't know if he's our, he might be our earliest, um, like signature artist, I believe is Stuart. Cool. So he's been with us a long, long time. And then Simon Phillips also, uh, in the late seventies was another icon who joined Thomas. So, you know, we had some pretty killer artists early on that enjoyed the brand and enjoyed the sound. And it was really interesting for me growing up there. Cause I, of course I know the American brands and then I see the three primary Japanese brands that being Tama and Pearl and Yamaha kind of come onto the scene. And I was like, what's, what, what's up with these? And then I start checking them out and I'm like, yeah, good quality, sound good. And price is very competitive. So what's not to like? Yeah. Yeah. It's more modern too. Like I love the, you know, I love the American brands. I love all the brands, but, but there's something about the Japanese stuff, which seemed like, um, it's almost like a scrappiness where like you had to innovate to, to compete. So you better be coming up with the most, um, you know, innovative things possible. And, and I also want to say that with Simon Phillips, you get him wearing Tama leggings, um, in his instructional <laughs> tapes, which is like, <laughs> awesome. that's devotion. The, yeah. Yeah. There it's, it's so, it's a, again, so beautiful, the industry and, and the connection, you know, that we're, we're so lucky, like and maybe not lucky, but we just, maybe we're just insightful and, and we appreciate, you know, the connection of, of music and life and the expression of our inner selves through music. And, and that's so personal, you know, Bard and, and the people who are yeah. into the brands that they play and, and it, it's any brand, you know, I, I love that there's a personal connection to the brands. I love it. I do too. And there is a serious personal connection to the brand. I mean, and, and maybe that's a good time for me to just give, give him a shout out. There's a, a guy named Johnny Martin who shot me a message like a week ago, which is perfect timing because we're doing this, but just talking about how much he loves Tama. And uh, I just want to say that because there's there's obviously this, in many brands, there are these groups of people who are so beyond passionate that it's just like, uh, it's, I mean, like I, I use the word obsession in a great way because obviously we're all obsessed with the drums, but um, but I, I don't think it should be, you know, skimmed over that, that there is a very passionate group of collectors and enthusiasts with, Tama, but also with every brand. I mean, God, you, it's mainly, you know, you look at Facebook, like the Rogers guys, um, there's Camco guys, there's everything you could ever imagine. So I just totally agree with what you're saying. Very, 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 very passionate um, people here. And Tama has a great, which, you know, you're doing something right. If you've got people who, who from the beginning, love what you do, I think it's, it's a testament to the company. Yeah. That, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. I think the industry is full of that. And, and, you know, a cool thing about our, again, our, our instrument category, drums and percussion and cymbals is, is the products age well. And it's, it's so cool to be able to play a vintage kit from the fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, and just feel like it's like got some personality, you know, and, and, it, yeah. and it's useful. It's not like a, a, an Atari game or a computer, you know, from 1986. Yeah. It's you're like, yeah, it's novel. It's cute, but I would never use it. No, you know, we can take these old drums out, rehead them, make them sound awesome, and 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 explore our personalities through the instrument. And that that's a just beautiful thing. I th- I love hearing too. I love Stuart Copeland. So it's neat to hear that he was kind of the first guy. I didn't even. I mean, I, you always think Billy Cobham, but it's like, of course, Stuart Copeland. I mean, he he's just you know, and that's that's where there's kids in the front row and they're looking at this you know drum head for an hour of a concert or on TV, and it says Tama and. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where it begins. The drum head is, is, is a nice, it, no pun intended, but good impact. Yeah. So Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's, for the sake of time, let's push forward here. Yeah. So we're in the seventies, obviously yeah. very innovative time. Tom is like, you know, really making the uh, big companies kind of shake in their boots and be, be noticed. Um, so take it away from there. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, just continues. Basically the message is, is the blueprint has been written, I think, as far as innovation and, and, you know, looking and what can we do better? So we realize drums are, you know, the sound of drums are important and we get into the crest stars and the art stars and, and try to do some things different sonically. Um, Certainly we've, we've up to this point, a lot of birch most, I think it's mostly birch. And then we get into art star two and that's the first maple kit, Uh, Mm -hmm. bigger kits, bigger sizes. Again, listening to the drumming community, 
amplification's getting louder and and we need to have stronger drums, a stronger sound. So we just very humbly listened and realized we got to produce a larger sound and and die cast hoops were instituted and longer toms instituted and and the metal market responded. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but obviously you said longer toms and it made me think of the uh, the octobonds, which are kind of just a um they're about as iconic of, you know, just a, a, a an innovation that that came out as as anything else in the drum world. When, when was that? Yeah, so that was in the seventies. And I, I actually, cool. now that you mention it, I believe that is the product that Billy Cobham was inspired to see ah. at the NAMM show in in the seventies, seventy seven in Houston. There there was like a, this secretive. Here's this little product in in a apparently it was you know in a, in a side booth or some thing that was not on the floor. And he saw those octobonds and he's like, yes. Melodic, very <laughs> cool. Uh, so yeah. that happened in, in like 77 ish. Um, yeah. And those obviously became important for him and important for Stuart Copeland, Simon, all the key guys that were playing had these beautifully tuned octobonds. So yeah. that was then. And uh, yeah. Yeah. But the gong bass drum. The obviously, gong, I have that was my another little... thing that Billy's like, if yeah. I come over to Tama, you got to make me a gong bass drum. So we did that. So, you know, That's again, so cool. we're just sort of following the artist's leads. You know, they're telling us what to invent sometimes, and then we invent it, and then we improve it. Hmm. Now, a gong bass drum, maybe we just pause there for a sec. I've, I've seen them many times, obviously, you know, on stages, and you see some of the, 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 the mega drummers use them. But for just an average guy, you don't typically go, hey, I, I'm going to run out right now and buy a gong bass drum <laughs> um, and just throw it on my four piece. Um, so... The technology, though, is basically it's a normal bass drum that's mounted, typically no bottom head, right? And then the top head is bigger than the shell, yeah. and it has... Like a timpani head. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, this was like, this was when, you know, back in the 70s and 80s when, let's go bigger. You know, let's let's add another drum. And yeah. <laughs> so, again, exactly. if you haven't checked out Billy Cobb, just check him out, and you'll see some incredible gong drum stuff <laughs> happening there. It's amazing. Um. It's so cool. All right. Well, now, if we're getting into the 80s, I want to make sure we talk about, and again, Johnny Martin, who's the big collector, kind of sent me a list of stuff, and he was like, make sure you talk about this. We've talked about it previously on the, I did a 5,000 episode, but I want to make sure we talk about with Camco and the buying of the rights with DW, and how did that work with Camco? Like, what's the deal with that? Yeah, so, okay, so... um I, I know bits and pieces. I, you know, I wasn't, wasn't with the company then, and so... That happened in like 77, I believe, late, like 77, 78. And uh, there was an opportunity to purchase part of the Camco like brand. Um, so as what eventually happened is DW got the rights to the turret lug and Tama got rights to, I don't know, all the hardware, but certainly the Camco pedal, um, which was a, a leather strap drive at, at at the time and then we realized we you know that that part was wearing out and let's make it into a sprocket drive and so we made the, the camco tama pedal with the sprocket um so that was you know 77 78 so we still own the camco name the brand name and dw still owns the the design for the turret lug and i think it's served both companies really well um, yeah so that's where it sits and cool. yeah so it's pretty cool to, you know, have that. Um, so that, that's that part. And what, what, sure. what else with, with Johnny? What, what is, what were some other topics? So, um, he just said basically in 85, and again, this is, I just love that this is coming from a, a, a diehard collector who, you know, these are some, some things he just wants to talk about. So in 85, Hoshino USA made a custom shop in Ben Salem. Oh, Ben Salem. Yeah. From, that's where ben I Salem, work now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you are. So, um, it's the, it, to his knowledge, he said it's the first time a company offered custom paint jobs to the public. I don't know if there's, if that's, you know, so a, a fact. It, we did do some assembly here and actually the, when, when we, to rewind back to the Camco, um, you know, era, we, we changed the badge a little bit and put like a Kempko Hoshino badge together. And we did drum production here in Ben Salem from maybe 78, 79 to about 1983. Um, so we, mm. we kind of had some drum production here uh, with assembly and finishes. So we, we were set up for that. And then 
I, it, as far as the mid eighties go and doing customized things. Yeah, we did some, I, we did some things, but I don't have a very detailed knowledge about, you know, what we had, what we were capable of doing. Sure. So that part I'm going to sort of, uh, you know, just respectfully that's, say I'm not an expert. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's fine. And I, and I, I mean, let's just throw it out there that maybe that's something that happened, but you got to be careful with saying who was first because there's always, there's, there's, there's frequently someone who goes, well, no, actually six days earlier, you know, Pearl was doing it or something. And like, you can't be too right. um, specific yeah. on that, but yeah, that's, I that's a fair thing. So. so, yeah. Yeah. All right. So then, 80s um that's all he's got for the 80s but it's just to me that it's even more of like tama just you know powering through and becoming more of a powerhouse and even more of i mean you kind of think of the 80s as like maybe not so much with ludwig but like i think of slingerland and i know that slingerland went through and made amazing drums for a long time so i'm saying that for the slingerland guys and girls out there but um but really you think of like Slingerland sort of being really in trouble and Tama and the Japanese brands just, you know, shooting to the moon um, to use a star kind of uh, space. Yeah, reference. Nice. But um, that, that had to be a massive time of growth for the company. Yeah, I, it, absolutely. And it, acoustic drums were flourishing um, you know, during that time in larger sets and double bass kits and heavier and louder and, you know, more rock solid and, you know, bigger, stronger. So Tama was absolutely at the forefront of that. And our market perception was they, you know, super rock solid and great sounding drums that are, that are very sturdy. So it's, it certainly fit the times. Um, and, and our hardware developments were, were doing well. And, and, you know, Iron Cobra pedal was, was being um, certainly e- evolving at that point. So lots of cool things. And, and yeah, we, we had a great run and, and, you know, products, Asian products were still kind of getting refined as far as the build quality and the price value. And I think there were some big improvements there that allowed drummers to say, that's a really nice sounding kit uh, that I can afford. And I think I'm going to buy that kit because it, it feels good. It looks good. It sounds good. It looks durable and it's a great value. So yeah, yeah I, I meet so many drummers, Bart, I'm sure you do. And everybody's like, oh yeah, I had a swing star kit. Yeah, Man, I exactly. That. Oh, you know, my first kit was a rock star. I hear that all the time. And and much like, you know, the Pearl export kits and, you know, they're just, you know, certainly there were Pearl and, and Tama entry level kits were allowing drummers to enter, you know, their, their drumming, um, you know, spirit class basically or, or their path yeah, at a really, sure. really good price point. Yeah. And they're real drums. They're not you know, the, the, the Macy's catalog drum set that, um, is sort of a a toy. These are more real deal. Yeah, absolutely. Real deal. Yeah. The rock stars and the swing stars and stuff are to this day, obviously very, very, very good. Um, not even beginner. Cause I feel like with any drum set like that, you can throw good heads on them and make them sound great. So they're not, they're not a toy. They're nothing to be like, you know, not ashamed of, but you know what I mean? They're nothing to be kind of like, Oh, this is just my beginner set. Like you can use these things for a long time. No question. Uh, huge value, you know, and, and I see them all the time, um, you know, on, on reverb or, you know, Facebook marketplace or wherever. And, and yeah, those drums, you know, you, you, you get a nice kit, use kit, um, you know, 250, 200, you know, exactly. and they sound, like you said, you put new heads on them. Boom. They're, tone is great yeah and you mentioned the iron cobra which i've that was probably my first real deal bass drum pedal that i got was an iron cobra which i still have still love um it's obvious i have a double pedal but i I think i'd basically just use it as a single because i haven't done as much double drumming um double bass drumming in the last couple years but it such a good pedal i mean there was just something about it it was like like buying it for the first time which you know obviously no double bass drum pedal or you know, ba- a single pedal is a different story, but they're not cheap. Any double pedal you get is not cheap. So just buying it, it was like, whoa, this is the real deal. Uh, and it just is such a cool design. I just love the, the, the name Iron Cobra is in itself such a cool thing, which now that I think about it, it's kind of a departure from the space theme. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You're right. And the, yeah, some of our hardware is <clears throat> first chair thrones and road pro stands. So the the star naming um, more on the drum side than the hardware, but that was a marketing yeah. decision. 
uh, again, preceded me by, by a, a long shot, but uh, sure. it, it, it is, it's just it form follows function. And we were able to, uh, with the connecting rod and a, and a, you know, secondary pedal on the left side with a connecting rod, put two beaters into the single frame. And that was our mm-hmm. big breakthrough. Cause there were, there was, uh, an, another company, uh, you know, on the West coast, real big company, two yeah. letters. I think, you know, um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we know. Yeah. So they were, you know, they're super good at innovation too. And, and, you know, much respect and, Yep. They were using, uh, they, I think they had created a double pedal, but it was the, the second beater was not inside uh, the single frame. So when that happened, that changed the feel uh, to something that was more realistic and, and expressive. Yeah. And I have to nerd out and say, I think that was the 5002 invented by Dwayne Livingston, who's actually on Facebook and is just like a super nice guy. Um, and, you know, which is just so cool to be like, it's just a a drummer like us who's who came up with that yeah that design well, the history yeah of and drums is filled you know with with people that were just they were just dudes just innovating you know and exactly love that. Ex- yeah that's the coolest part but um all right so then uh what is our so like if we're in 80s getting into the 90s maybe we take a second here and just talk about some of the lines that are out um because then this is getting into more like you know modern era of drums so there would be like you take it away but it would be the, you know what's the lowest to the highest they had uh on the market then as far as the range of of drums well so um star classic was uh was born in in 1994 so that's the okay. kit you have and and that that was our high-end kit um at that time and boy going through um the star classic performer then was also developed and that's with bird shells. Uh, the, I want to say rock star kit in diff- with, with different orientations, finish orientations, and then swing star, um, and then imperial star. So that basically was what we were looking at. And then obviously mm-hmm. out of star classic, so much kind of, uh, flowered out of that star classic, Babinga, star, star classic, yeah. birch Babinga. Uh, and now we have Star Classic Walnut Birch and a brand new series, Star Classic Performer, which is mm. um, Maple and Birch. So that's that's new for 2021. So, you know, there's a lot there. And then in uh, 2013, we launched the Star Series, which are handmade in Japan at our Japanese um, Katsuki factory. And that's the epitome of our high end. So that's Star the binga and star maple and star walnut drums come out of there. So cool. that's kind of where it sits. And they're just really, really gorgeous instruments. So it, it's, it's cool for us to have that. And, and we did then also in that time period, lots of development on snare drums, uh, star phonic snare drums, the artist signature palette, and then uh, SLP snare drums. So that, as you said, it's sort of the modern product offering. So from that, you know, side of things, um, that's really, that's where things were, you know, where we are now. We also have superstar in the line back, um, as a name different than the, the original superstar drums that were from the late seventies and eighties. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Now, what is the deal with SLP, which stands for Sound Lab Project? What is the, uh, what's the story with that? Cause I, I've played some, I think I played a kit at, um, at PASIC last year or the year before, I've lost track of when things were normal uh, at this point. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, um, let's say 2019, I think. And you, 2019. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but they're just awesome. Like, so what is, what is the sound lab? So that's exactly what it is. It, so it, it's um, evolved from our snare drums, which the concept of the snare drums was to, to develop snare drums that were each unique and different, not so conventional in a way like here's your brass six and a half in your brass five and a half in your brass five um you know five by 14 or whatever it, it and here's your steel and here's your wood that's really the traditional way that that snare drums have been offered in the market so the concept that tama came up with uh was to create kind of boutique differentiated snare drums that each have a different voice within the slp line so one might be brass one might be aluminum one might be maple one might be walnut and they're super accessible price points that each have a unique sonic personality. That's cool. And, you know, jumping around here, I'm just like looking through the website, the uh, Tama website. And I just think that there's a, 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 
a heritage of like, I think things got a little far out in the sixties and seventies, which I love with, with the finishes, but there's still very cool finishes to the Tama drums. Um, I'm just looking, there's like, you know, a beautiful green kit. There's, they're very unique. And I say, you know, the sixties and seventies, if anyone looks at those old kits, I mean, they are just like, there are some, the satin flames and stuff. It was very, which it would be cool if they brought, you know, that stuff back. But that being said, you guys have very uh, unique and beautiful finishes. And I think I saw online a video of someone doing, gosh, what was it? It's almost, you're going to know right away the name of it, but it's like a red kind of like, like streak. Yeah, um, Phantasm Lacquer Oyster. And then I, there was a video of them creating mm-hmm. that and it was not just print out, you know, Ooh. a wrap and throw it on. It was like hand, oh, yeah, hand painted. Done. Yeah, that, that's, that's part of the, um, so our, our factory, you know, it gets into manufacturing stuff. So we manufacture star in, in Japan and then uh, most other drums are coming from our Tama owned factory in, in China, which we started in about 2004, 2003. Um, so that's our own factory that we own and we develop our, our projects and products and then take that information and, and then go implement it in China. So um, we have our, our painters there are really skilled and they hand paint shells and that's what you're seeing. And that's what's creating yeah. these beautiful lacquer oyster finishes that we're, we're able to offer um, within our, our Star Classic line that are super, just super compelling and different and, you know, interesting and intricate and, and really good price points. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of incredible. Really, so, Yeah. There was a, uh, when I was in high school, I worked at Guitar Center and there was a, um, there was a pink sparkle Bubinga kit there mm. that um, I would just sit on and play because I mean, I, that was sort of the downfall of like retail stores where minus people dropping their, their kids off to be babysat by a drum set and then they'd go over to, you know, <laughs> whatever stores next door. I would just be sitting there a lot and those drums, the Bubinga line, I remember uh, just when it first got there, it was just this like holy grail of a drum set. There's something about it that was just so like present and it just felt like honestly one of the most, out of all the drums there, it felt like one of the most professional high-end drum sets I've, I've ever played at that point. Um, so the the what is Bubinga? I know it's obviously a type of wood, but maybe a little, little info on that. Yeah, so... Um yeah, awesome. So I, we were somehow the company associated most with Babinga. Um, yeah, it is a type of wood. Uh, it comes from, I believe, Africa. And we we just started using it and implementing it and then realized it had super deep, low tonal qualities to it. And making a whole drum set out of, out of Babinga just created a different sonic imprint of a drum set. And rich and fat, low end, um, they do sound awesome. I mean, I remember when those came out and, and I checked out a kit and I'm like, I, I'd never heard a bass drum sound like that. Um, yeah. Just super dense and present, um, but with this huge, rich low end. So that's something that, you know, we, we cultivated a lot and we still offer Babinga on the Star line. Um, it has been removed on the Star Classic line due to the CITES um, the trade restrictions of, of endangered sure. woods. Even though the wood sourcing that we use is is cultivated wood and farmed wood and, and sustainable, um, it's just complicated to get the clearance of the wood, um, all, all the different processes that you have to do to get it uh, substantiated and cleared. It's just it's it's a big administrative hurdle. So we decided yeah. that we're going to move away from that. And at the same time, it had been in the line for quite a long time. So that's why we now have walnut birch and, and maple birch and um, you know, different drums that do different things sonically. Cause you know, we, we always have to keep things fresh. So it's kind of a, a, it was a timely issue and also kind of forced our, our hand due to the, the trade restrictions of endangered woods. So, yeah, yeah, sure. And man, you saying keeping it fresh, just looking on the website, basically on, on every kit you click on, there's just some new, like, like little innovative detail where it's not really changed since the seventies, where it's still just this m- really running forward fast with with innovative um ideas and and things to keep it interesting especially with the hardware obviously the drums are beautiful but just the little like details i mean you starcast. guys are so de- yeah start yeah exactly I, I, so starcast system is to me the most beautiful and then and the most useful 
suspension system in the market um, because it's it's suspended. We don't touch any tension rods. It's all done through the hoop, and the hoop has extra holes to suspend the drum. So as far as and, and just the way it's it's designed, there's no stress on the shell. Um, there's really no stress on the hoops. So the drums stay in tune. They resonate fully, and it looks incredible. It's such an integrated and lovely, silky smooth, sexy setup. It, it just yeah. looks incredible. And I, I've been a long time admirer of, of the Starcast system um, and just really, really appreciate that design. Yeah, man, that's so cool. So, all right, as we wrap up here, um, is there anything, I know the world is kind of upside down right now and things are a little slowed down, but is there anything that, uh, you know, the Tama diehard fans can be looking forward to in the future that you'd maybe want to talk about here or uh, anything like that? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is interesting. Um, your podcast is going to live on forever. So, so this yeah. is, uh, what, <laughs> this is for the record. We're in the COVID sort of the COVID. Yes. Growth. 2021. Uh, yep. So what was that? Read all about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, kids, here we are, but yeah, um, it, it's been a, a challenging time to product develop because we just, because we haven't been able to travel and our R and D team can't, go to our all of our factories and go to um, our Chinese factory and, and you know check out samples so it, it, it definitely has hurt the flow of our development but at the same time it's allowed us to sort of work closer together and as I mentioned earlier we do have a new uh, star classic performer series that is at the the easiest entry price point for star classic and it's their uh, maple and bird shells and they sound fantastic they look fantastic and that's brand new for 2021. So feel free to check that out. There's information on the web now. Uh, and, and we just, you know, we continue to evolve our, our product lines and, you know, you're always going to see new things from Tama. It, it's yeah. just part of our DNA and it's part of what we do as a company to, to keep innovating. And that, that's really an ethos of our, of our company um, is to continue to, to innovate and bring fresh things in the market. Cause we feel that it, it you know, drummers want it. They look forward to it and we're just feeding the curiosity. So that's what we're going to keep doing. That's awesome. Well, um, everyone can find Tama obviously just by, you know, Googling it or go to Tama.com, T-A-M-A.com. Um, I think to this day still Tama is the the strongest name in drums mm -hmm. as they, as they, the, the slogan says, I think that's very, uh, you know, well-earned and you guys continue to push forward and, uh, and I, I always try and be unbiased with everything, but I do really like Tama and I think they're, they're great drums and have, you know, kind of one of my, like I said, my, you know, it was a great drum set to buy and I loved it. And it was just amazing um, to have that star classic kit as a kid. So, cool. um, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're fans of the industry, you know, and, and we love watching, um, you know, the, what the other brands do and, and, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a friendly competition for sure. Um, but you know, the industry is exciting and, and, you know, innovation happens in obvious places and not obvious places. So it's fun to keep up. Um, but yeah, we're, we're humbled and, you know, we're just going to yeah. try to do our thing and, and keep bringing product into the market that hopefully inspires. And, you know, as, as, as you said, it's just, you know, you're the, the drummer out there and, and you're the ones expressing. So, you know, what is it that we can do to help express that? That's really our, our that's what we do. And before we end, I want to, so I have this awesome little, uh, history of Tama book that they, that you guys sent over and I want to give a shout out. Cause I talked to him on the phone. Very, I would just say lovely man is a good way to, as I put it, very, very nice guy. I want to say a thank you to Mitsuaki Shimada, or I think his friends call him Mike, um, for just kind of really, we talked on the phone for a while and he was at the post office trying to send me a book, but there was a storm and he <laughs> couldn't get it over to me. And, uh, just uh, he 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 had the great idea. I've made the mistake before of uh, I made a call to uh, someone in Germany, and I ended up having a hundred and fifty dollar phone bill. Ooh. Where Mike was smart enough to say, "Let's do it over, you know, Facebook or Zoom." And I'm like, you know, you only you only learn from your mistakes, you know. And uh, just a little fun side note there. But thank you to Mike. And yeah, uh, yeah Mike. Yeah. Mike's had a long career important career with tama um all those stories that we talked about from the 70s and 80s mike was at the forefront of all of that so um he was you know a huge guy for the brand and i say was because he he recently retired uh and gave his life to the brand and you know yeah i appreciate you you know appreciating him 
Um, yeah. cause it's people like Mike, you know, that, that, you know, it's the collective benefit that of their work that, that brings it all to motion. So shout out to Mike. Absolutely. Shout out to Mike. So, um, all right. And if you're listening to this, um, John and I are going to do a quick, probably 10 minute extra little conversation about some other Thomas stuff. I have a couple of, you know, smaller kind of maybe not so uh, drum related questions. I want to talk about the ventures and the electric guitar, you know, fad that went through Japan, which I thought thought was fascinating in this book. Um, But so if you want to hear that little bonus conversation, head over to uh, patreon.com slash drum history podcast and you can pay, you know, two bucks or whatever and join the Patreon and uh, get these weekly bonus episodes. So um, on that note, John, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your uh, you know, vast knowledge and passion and love for Tama with me and the listeners. It, thanks for having me, Bart. I'm glad we could connect this up and uh, really enjoyed talking about you know the thing we love talking about. So thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.